Hello, I'm Phil Marshall and welcome to my studio and thank you for your interest in uh, seeing what I do and how I do it. Well, how I do things and why I do them is mainly, I think, because I think in pictures rather than in words most of the time. And my work is, in general, taking those ideas and pictures I see up here and turning them into something in the real world in either two or three dimensions that other people can see. So I'm a painter and a sculptor. And because I'm working from here out, it's most important that the things that I use and the places I do it are very, very flexible to allow me to produce whatever it is I'm trying to produce the best way. So I don't have a lot of very specialized and expensive equipment because I feel that that would sort of push me in a rut and force me to, rather than what's up here, say, well, what have I got? What can I make with what I've got? Let me take you through the, the process that I use when I produce a bit of sculpture. It starts here in, the, in my studio. Um, as you can see, it's mainly a painting studio, just like any other painting studio. I've got an easel here, which adjusts up and down and allows me to put stretch canvases of different sizes in it. What's different maybe is when I'm painting large canvases, I want to be able to lay them on the floor. So pretty much everything in this studio is on wheels or can be moved out of the way so that I can lay out on a big floor area, paint my, paint my canvas. Uh, the one on the back wall here is a, a one in point. And uh, when I think I've got what I want, I can pin it up on those rails that you can probably see along the back there and stand back and have a look and take it down again and put it on the floor if, until I'm happy with, with what I've got. From a sculpture point of view, this is where my sculpture work really starts. So let me take you through the process that I usually use when I make a piece of sculpture. I uh, take sketches of the things that I have up in my mind here. I try and capture them like taking a photograph so that I can, uh, it's a memory jogger in the future because it's no good just thinking of something and saying, oh, that would be a good thing to make, go off and make it because by the time I've got halfway down to the basement to make it, I've already thought of something else. So I take a whole bunch of these sketches and I keep them and occasionally I thumb through and I say, ah, maybe this is something worth making. Let's go see. So to go see, usually what I do is make a very simple model out of something like paper or wire or cardboard, something like that, just to make sure that well, what I was really thinking of and sketched does make some sort of sense in the real world and might be interesting enough to actually turn into something that other people may want to see. Here's an example I'm working on on a piece of sculpture right now. I'm still not sure whether I'm going to make it or not. This is the model I made a few months ago. It's bent wire stuck in a piece of, piece of wood. We'll see how that goes. In the case of Next Stop Shibuya, I've been thinking a lot about my time in Japan and the various aspects of that, the, uh, the trials and tribulations of trying to go to work in the rush hour in Tokyo and also the very interesting artistic shapes that are very prevalent in Japan. And I had this idea that something might work and I really wanted to try it. So I took a couple of pieces of paper or thin cardboard and I cut a curve in them, both of them like this, pushed them together. And I thought if I glue those together, I get the sort of shape that I was fascinated me in Japan and I thought wow that looks interesting enough. Once I find something interesting enough to take to the next stage I really have to find out whether it makes any practical sense for me to make. So I need to go to my drawing board which is right here and I have to do a whole bunch of detailed work to figure out whether it makes real sense to make at all. So I have to worry about what material to use, how big to make it, how um, to make sure it's safe enough where its center of gravity is, how I'm going to make it, how I'm going to put it together, how I'm going to take it to a particular location to install, how I'm going to install it, how maybe even I'm going to store it. Now, assuming I'm happy 
with the calculations and the model and I feel I've got something that I still want to make and can, then it's probably the time I go down to the workshop and really get into making what I've been building up to. But even before then, sometimes I make what's called a marquette. And a marquette is a scale model that you use, you can take measurements from, and then produce the full-sized piece. Uh, in the case of uh, stone, stone monuments that you see, especially older ones that were made by famous sculptors, very often the sculptor didn't actually make that big thing. If you take the uh, Lincoln Memorial down in Washington, D.C., there's Abraham Lincoln sitting back in his chair. Daniel Chester French, who is the sculptor for that, did not go down to Washington, D.C. with his, with his uh, hammer and chisel and actually carve that Thing out of stone down there at all. He made a maquette and a bunch of Italian skilled stone carvers, uh, I think they came from New York City, took his maquette, took the measurements and carved the big thing. So when you go down to Washington DC and see this big sculpture that Daniel Chester French did, please bear in mind it wasn't Daniel Chester French that actually made what you see. What he made was the maquette that other people turned into that massive monument. So this, um, I have here a marquette I'm working on right now, which is uh, the marquette for that wire model head you saw earlier. This is made of steel, um, and it is an inch and a half to a foot. So this represents four inch strip seal, which is a stock, standard stock size that I can get from my supplier. And uh, this will work out to be about 10 feet, tall, 10 feet tall. In the case of next stop Shibuya, uh, I did make a marquette. I made that up here because it's just made of cardboard. And uh, based on that, I was happy with what I saw. I was able to go down to the go down to the workshop, buy the steel, cut the steel, and then go outside to actually push it together. And weld it. I do all my welding outside and uh, any heavy duty uh, grinding that causes lots of sparks or if it's stone lots of dust and lots of noise. I tend to do all that outside. Once I've done that and I have the piece made or the pieces made <clears throat> I can assemble and install it outside here and make sure that it's really come out as I expected and I've got there are no issues with putting the the component pieces together that I have to do when I go and do an installation. And I can also leave it out here to do some weather trials, make sure everything works as it should. Silly things like it doesn't blow over, for instance, in a high wind, uh, which uh, would be uh, an unfortunate thing to do in a public space. Also, if I have not shown a piece before and I need to put it, give it to a jury to decide whether they want to put it in a particular show, uh, I need an image, so it's at this point I take an image while it's in the backyard. Um, then if all goes well, I have my piece, I can store it, and when the time comes, take it to where I want, want to go. And that is really the whole process that I have. I work from, probably from here, to some sketches over there, to producing a model, and if that goes well, doing the detailed calculations to then producing the maquette, and then I can finally make the real thing. I make the real thing in pieces, take it outside, glue it together, take some pictures, and I'm ready to go. So let me take you around through those other spaces just very quickly so you can at least see where I do that work. This is my shop where I make a lot of my sculpture uh, I bend my steel and tubes and things like that here. Uh, it looks very much like any wood shop that a lot of people have, but quite often I have to have uh, diamond blades to actually cut the sort of material that I'm playing with. Uh, there are tools, special tools I have for bending pipes and tubes and uh, sheet steel. They are uh, hidden away most of the time. You're looking at a lovely stone wall here, which is part of the walkout from my basement. So it's below grade and it's where I do my welding. 
am I grinding and all sorts of things that make a noise and are too dangerous to do anywhere else. It's open to the air so any noxious gases can escape. The uh, funky looking drapes behind are in fact welding blankets which are fireproof. So this whole area outside is open to the air, almost soundproof and fireproof. It's a great place to work and the welding equipment is the sort of equipment that is uh, best for working outdoors with when uh, it, can, it can survive with there's a bit of wind. I love it out here. While we're outside I thought I'd show you this piece which reminds you maybe of Next Stop Shibuya. I made it some years before that piece. This is made of slate. Uh, great great material to work with and looks and looks pretty good this time of year against the Japanese maple in particular. One of the big issues we have with doing temporary outdoor sculpture is what to do with it, where to store it in the uh, off season. Uh, I keep it all over the place. Here's a bunch of stuff, uh, some which will be going out this year. Uh, it's not the only storage I have. Um, and here's next stop Shibuya tied up here waiting to be undone and ready to go. Well, there we are. That's pretty much it for the process that I use most of the time. If it's a very simple piece, of course, I can miss out some of those intermediate steps that I went through today. But that is basically how it goes. It takes quite a while, obviously. And I thank you for your interest in watching this today. And if you want to see any of my sculpture, then quite often you can see it at these outdoor shows that happen every summer throughout New England. And also you can look at my website whenever you like and see what I've got there, which is www.philmarshallstudio, all one word, dot com. Thank you. a lot of time in Japan and I, there's obviously some Japanese influence in the, in the shapes of this. And I was interested in how you can get such a complex shape out of what is just a couple of flat pieces of steel actually, just the way they're cut and welded together, forces them into this uh, interesting shape. Well I think it's an interesting shape. And then Having done it, I had to organize how they were going to be in relation to one another. Um, I usually do two things because it adds that component of interaction, um, which 
which sort of sometimes makes you think of how people react and also it gives an opportunity for what we call negative space between the shape of that that these things hold between them uh, is another piece of the sculpture and it's called Next Stop Shibuya because if you ever have the uh, experience of being on the, uh, on the commuter rail or the metro in Tokyo in the rush hour you know what it's like and you've probably seen pictures of people they get pushed into the pushed into the carriages up against one another and in fact it's um, it's a it's quite an unpleasant experience you're so pressed together it's a, it's a bit like when a python uh, strangles something they don't squeeze them to death what they do is as you breathe out as you breathe in your chest expands and as you breathe out goes in and then they do is they just check in a bit so you can't breathe out so far and that's what happens when you're on the on the metro in the rush hour in Tokyo you're so pressed up against people right up against them um, and being that close together everybody tries to maintain their own personal space even though they're being touched on all sides and so people stay isolated in some way to maintain their own personal being even in that tight situation and the way these were sort of in together made me think of that and being in being on the metro and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed knowing i was going to get off at the station shibuya which is just a, one of the one of the major stations in tokyo i was just praying for the next stop shibuya so i thought i know i call this next stop shibuya because it was what was in my mind as we were pressed together